Next year, in February, Tom and I are going to take a group to Israel. If you're interested in going, you can contact Elisa in the church office, and she'll get your name on our Israel list so you can receive information. But when we go to Israel, Tom's favorite place, his favorite spot of all of them, is the top of Mount Carmel. When you go to the top of Mount Carmel, and you may see it up here in a, in a picture, you can see to the east on a clear day, you can see the Mediterranean Sea. And it's not close, it's far away, but because of just the height of this mountain and the terrain of the land, you can see it. And then to your north and to the west and to the south, you see this vast valley, the Jezreel Valley. It's a, it's a valley where many battles have been fought through the ages. And even today, there's um, an Air Force, uh, what do you call those? An Air, they don't call it, a, do they call it a base? Well, it's a hangar in that place, and it's underground. And so as you're standing there, the Israeli Air Force is flying their jets, and they seemingly just go completely out of sight as they go into their underground hangar. But this was the location where Elijah had the showdown with the prophets of Baal. And that's where we're going to focus our attention today. You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to be a little bit in chapter 17, a teeny bit in chapter 16. But Elijah had his showdown with the prophets of Baal here on Mount Carmel. And today I'm going to give you four ways to ignite your prayers so that they work. If you're taking notes, you'll be able to go home with four ways to ignite your prayers so that they work. And then along the way, I'm going to give you five secrets that will tremendously help you when you pray. And I'm going to do all this in three points. So you got that? Five, four, and three. And perhaps the reason God gave me this message for us on Mother's Day is because there's nothing more powerful for a mom to tap into than this privilege of prayer that God's given us. Now, I, three weeks ago, had absolutely nothing to say to you this morning. And I was concerned about it and praying for it. And I prayed to the Lord, and he delivered exceedingly abundantly beyond all I could ask or imagine. So we may be here until 5 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I put all the overflow into three podcasts. I, I have a podcast out there. It's the Leanne McCoy podcast. And in that podcast, I'm going to give you a lot more deeper dive into this message. I told Tom, I, I prayed for a message and God gave me a weekend retreat. And so those extra episodes that you'll look for are called, These Are the Days of Elijah. And then, What the Heck? A Prayer God Always Answers. Mm -hmm and PUSH, with the capital P-U-S-H. Those, those are the podcast episodes you're looking for. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, I thank you so much for this gathering today, both online and in the worship center at Thompson Station Church. And Lord, we invite you to, to remove any distractions and God, to open not just our physical ears, but our spiritual ears, the one the ones that penetrate right down to the joint and the marrow of our bones to our very souls, the ears that you can open and you can close. Father, we pray that you would open those ears so that we hear exactly what you want us to hear and so that we can receive exactly what you've, you have for us today so that when we leave here, we can know that we are loved. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Point number one. These are the days of Elijah, and these are the days of us. Elijah served as a prophet during the period in history of the divided kingdom, what we call the divided kingdom. This was the time when the kingdom of Israel had the ten tribes of Israel who made up that kingdom, and the kingdom of Judah had two tribes, and they were actually ruled by the remaining remnant of the house of David in keeping with God's promise. And so... Elijah serves in the northern, Judah's the south, northern, uh, Israel's the north, and Elijah served the northern kingdom. If you track the histories of these two, in fact, much of the chronicles and the kings are tracking the history of these two kingdoms kind of simultaneously. 
And you'll see that Israel was much more wicked than Judah was, even though Judah caught up really fast. And in Israel, it seemed like all you had to do to be king was kill the king that was king before you. And then you got to be the king. And then we go through this parade of wicked kings with their... their um, you know, departure from the faith, increasing all along the way until we get to 1 Kings 16. And in 1 Kings 16, we read this in verses 30 through 33. Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight more than all who were before him. Then, as if following the sin of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, were a trivial matter, he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and proceeded to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings who were before him. You see, my friends, Ahab, by the time it got to him, he led Israel into a wholehearted national support of the worship of Baal. Now, I'm going to pause right here before I talk about what kind of an impact the worship of Baal had on the culture, and I'm going to explain to you who or what Baal is. If we look in Ephesians 6, verse 12, we're told that our battles are not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, and world powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This this right here is who Baal is. He's a demonic being carrying out the schemes of the devil. He's a ruler. He's an authority. He's a power of the dark world, a spiritual force of evil. According to Jonathan Kahn in his book, The Return of the Gods, Baal appealed to the Israelites. He wrote this. Baal promised the Israelites fertility, fruitfulness, increase, gain, and prosperity. As the Israelites settled and began cultivating the land, the temptation to invoke his powers grew more and more compelling. You see, Baal continues, though, today because he's a spiritual being. He doesn't die with a culture, with a, with a time period, with an era. Baal continues today and he is even today battling against the revelation of the glory of God because that's what spiritual warfare is. His mission is to destroy a nation's confidence and faith in God. When Ahab led the Israelites to endorse the worship of Baal as their national religion, the worship of God had already waned. We find out later that the altar where they used to worship God was in ruins due to neglect. Khan traces the destruction of faith in his book in American culture, making the argument that when we lost our spiritual safeguards, we became vulnerable to the ancient demonic powers that ruled the world throughout generations. You see, the powers of these rulers and authorities are only stifled and pressed back where the gospel takes root. In the 1960s, prayer was taken from the public schools and the Bible was banned from being a part of the curriculum. In that decade, leading magazines, newspapers, and television stations stopped printing or, or um, showing sermons. Did you know, I found this out, that um, in the 60s and maybe into the 70s, television stations would sign off at night. That in itself would be a good idea. But before they signed off at night, prominent preachers would deliver a devotion and then say a prayer. And of course, that is long gone. And then in 1980, the Ten Commandments were banned from the public square, which is an interesting thing for us to do, seeing as how they're etched on the walls of the Supreme Court. Khan then reminds us that Baal was the god of prosperity. In ancient agrarian Israel, he was credited with their bountiful harvest. In America today, we don't measure wealth in barley and olives and grapes we measure our wealth in financial portfolios. And the true indicator of the wealth of America as a whole is found on Wall Street 
in the New York Stock Exchange. The image of Baal was that of a bull. What sits on the street out in front of the, uh, of the stock market on Wall Street today? The image of a bull. My friends, Baal is among us. Not only did Ahab set up a national worship of Baal, but he also erected Asherah poles. Asherah poles were used to worship the goddess Ashtoreth, or Ishtar. She was the goddess of good times. She was the pursuit of wealth, you see, gives birth to indulgences. And Ashtoreth is the temptress and the seducer, with her angle being to get people to exchange their passion for God with a passion for earthly pleasure and treasure. Astrith was considered the wife of Baal. However, she was never faithful because she was led by her passion and her desire, choosing sexual pleasure and romance over commitment and hard work. She doesn't stop with destroying marriage in a culture. She sickens society by making sex a commodity and selling it through pornography and prostitution. She's a seducer, increasing intoxication by whatever substances are available. She was worshipped in her temples with sex and drugs. She was the goddess of spells and magic. She's a sorceress. And with her sorcery, she would alter people's affections, their passions, and their thoughts, and all at sometimes their very essence. She alters human desire human identity, human nature itself. In the worship of Ashtoreth, men dressed as women, women dressed as men. Some of them were even surgically altered. Ashtoreth is the spiritual force of evil, manipulating and maneuvering the minds of people who suffer gender dysphoria because of their disconnect from God. She's the dark force working behind addiction, pornography, and human trafficking. She's the destroyer of marriage and the exploiter of people who've lost their connection with God. Church, when we are on a mission to connect people with Jesus to experience his greater life, we are actively engaged in a battle against Baal, and Ashtoreth. 1 Kings 16.30 tells us, Ahab did what was evil in the sight of God more than all who were before him. Look around us, my friends. What must God be thinking of our country today? These are the days of Elijah. I go into a lot more detail about this in the podcast, and I even tell you about the worship of Molech, whose very name means abomination. But let's move on to the prayer life of Elijah. If Mount Carmel were the Olympic event in Elijah's life, then there had to be some previous experiences to prepare him for that moment in time. You see, your relationship with God, the part that no one sees but you, will build you in to the person you are when others are looking. Just a few weeks ago, my son and I were over at 1819 having our office in the afternoon on the um, picnic tables out in the yard. It's a wonderful place to office. And as we were sitting there, Pastor Dane, our youth pastor, came walking through. And I had actually gotten up because I have never gone back over to where the railroad tracks are over there behind 1819. I wanted to kind of venture over there and see it. And Pastor Dane said to me, are you going to walk on the railroad tracks? And I thought... No, I'm not going to walk on the railroad tracks. I'm just going to see them. He said, well, I'm going to walk on the railroad tracks. He said, I do it every month before I'm the message on our big, their big evangelistic message and the outreach to the community is city night, the first Wednesday night of the month. And he says, I always go there and I just spend some time with the Lord. And I thought, how cool is that? When nobody's looking, Pastor Dane's walking on the railroad tracks behind 1819. And I knew I'd seen the vitality of our youth ministry, and I knew I'd seen the growth, but what I'd never seen was Pastor Dane walking. And yet, he does. 
And in the same way, Elijah's prayer life before he got to Mount Carmel will give us great insight into what prepared him for that day. So let's take a look at 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from the Gilead settlers said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, I stand before him, and there will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. Wow, it had to take guts for a man of God to stand before a wicked king and deliver that message. And so God already prepared a quick escape for Elijah to the Wadi Cherith. And God told Elijah, you go over here to this wadi. This is a place where the water is flowing. I've prepared it all for you. I've even lined up the ravens to deliver your food to you every day. And I thought, well, how about that? God set up an Airbnb for Elijah during the drought, and it's all inclusive. I can just imagine Elijah settling in and getting ready to live out these three years. But the wadi dried up. Now, When I read that part, I thought, isn't that something? I wonder why the God who stopped the rain couldn't have given that wadi a supernatural source of water so that Elijah could have hung out there a little longer. It seems like a reasonable thing to me for God to do. But that dried up wadi wasn't about Elijah. It was about a widow and her son who lived a long way away in a place called Zarephath. And I want to stop right here and share your first secret, secret number one. Often the hard things we deal with in our lives are not about us. They're for someone who doesn't know God as well as we do. They're for someone who will get to know him better by watching how we go through that hard thing. So God told Elijah to go to Zarephath and to ask the widow to feed him. Now, we read this and we're like, oh yeah, I know this story. But I was reading this and thinking, what in the world? You're in a drought, everybody's having a hard time. So Elijah, I want you to go up here to Zarephath and I want you to find a widow, a widow of all people. She would be more desperate than anyone in a drought like this. And sure enough, she was. So one more little insight God's assignments on our lives often don't make sense, and they aren't easy. We're mistaken if we think the Christian life is a pathway to pain-free living and pleasure. You see, ours is a life of obedience and adventure that brings with it challenges that make for really good times and also make for some really icky times. Just say it. Baal and Ashtoreth are the gods you want to pursue if you're looking for prosperity and pleasure. Now, what I'm about to tell you is a cliff note version here. The rest is in that that podcast, but here we go. When Elijah got to Zarephath, he found the widow, and she was out looking for wood in order, she said to Elijah, to bake bread to make the very last meal that she and her son would have. And then she said, after that, we're going to just lay down and die. That's how desperate the situation was. And so Elijah says to her, the Lord has sent me here to tell you to take the bread that you're going to bake, the bread that you have, take the bread that you have, and I want you to feed it to me. And then I want you to just know that the bread you don't have is the bread that God's going to give you. And when he gives you to that, your flour and your oil are never going to run out. And you're going to survive, not only survive, but thrive through the whole rest of this drought. Now, I look at that story and I think, oh, okay, the man of God, he's going to eat the bread that I know I've got. He's going to eat the bread I know I've got. And you know what he wants me to eat? The bread I know I don't got. That's what he wants me to eat. And then if I had been her, I'd have been like, well, Elijah, you're the man of God. Why don't you eat the bread I know I don't got, you know? And I'll eat the bread we got. Nonetheless, she wouldn't like me. It's probably why God put me here and not there at that moment in time. And in 1 Kings 17, 15, we read that she proceeded to do according to the word of Elijah, and God proved faithful to his promise because she and her household ate for many days. And here's your second secret, my friends. 
Secret number two, God came through on his promise. He always does. But then after this, after they've been rocking along for a little time, she and Elijah having little chats at night over who God is and, and what he is on mission to do. The widow gets up one day and her son dies. Now this is where I just have to say, what the heck? Now I know heck is not a sacred word to say in this sacred spot on a Sunday morning. But for goodness sakes, and I think this mama prayed a seriously understandable what the heck prayer right here in verse 18. Man of God, what do we have in common? Have you come to remind me of my guilt and to kill my son? And her what the heck prayer leads us to our first scriptural glimpse into Elijah's prayer life. In verses 19 through 21, we read, but Elijah said to her, give me your son. So he took him from her arms and brought him up to the upper room where he, stay, he was staying and he laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and he said, my Lord God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow I am staying with by killing her son? Then he stretched himself out over the boy three times and he cried out to the Lord and he said, my God, please let this boy's life return to him. How about that? Elijah was a man. James 5, 17 says, just like us. And yet, he had his own version of what the heck prayer right then and there. He prayed, but he prayed privately between him and God. And then he prayed three times for that boy, begging specifically, asking God exactly for what he wanted him to do. How many times do you think Elijah would have prayed for that boy? I think as many times as it took. And don't miss verse 22. So the Lord listened to Elijah's voice, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Wow. The Lord listened to the voice of a man just like us and answered his prayer. You may be sitting here, and you're like, well, that's great, Leanne. This is a great story from the Old Testament. But does God still do that for us today? Well, I'm here to tell you, in fact, he does. The prayer clinic ministry is a place where we've promised to pray and stay with you until God answers your prayer. And we have trained prayer team leaders, members, that be genuinely believe that when we pray, God answers. So let me tell you what goes on in our prayer clinic team. We don't just gather on Sunday morning and minister to whoever wanders in our room or pray over the services like we're doing right this very minute, but we also pray 24-7 on a little app called Group Me. And I want to give, pull the curtain back and give you a little bit of the conversation that goes on on that Group Me app. This conversation happened in March, and I, I printed on Group Me from Sam. This is from John Knute being baptized with his son in a couple of weeks. Hey, Sam, I'm not sure if this is how I'm supposed to go about getting prayer requests out to the prayer clinic, but I'm a little desperate at the moment. Anything would be much appreciated. My father is older and has COVID. He's currently hospitalized with pneumonia and sepsis, and for his age, it's not looking good. Our family would greatly appreciate it. Now I'm going to just scroll. Heather, can you get contact info for him? She's our director. Me, Lord, we ask that you intervene in John's dad and show their family your power to heal. Joanne, asking the Lord to be very present with John's dad, bringing peace and healing. Rachel, he's in our connect group. Jason's been reaching out to him. I can send his contact information. I love that because that shows how we function in the health of this body, the small group ministry and the prayer ministry together. George, prayers for John's dad. Heather, thank you, Rachel. Pam, praying for John's dad now. Dawn, Lord, we love you so very much, and we thank you for John's salvation. Her prayer continued for comfort for the doctors and for healing. She closed by thanking God for the testimony that he's going to give John. 
Heather praying for John's father. Rachel, we just sent him screenshots of these prayers, and he's so very thankful and amazed at our church. Charlie, praying for the healing and complete recovery for John Knoop's father. Pat, praying for healing for John's dad. Tara, Lord, let this be a testimony of your perfect love for John's father and how you intervene in his life and his body by answering our prayers for him. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for loving John's father and his family. Kim, praying along with all of you for healing for John's dad. Linda, praying as well for John's father and family. Kathy, thank you, Father, for your hand being on John and his family. We ask you for healing. Ask you to reveal yourself in a powerful way that will affect many lives as we watch. Thank you for strengthening God's fa John's father's body and that as the great physician you have the final say. Lorraine, Lord, heal him and he will be healed. Save him and he will be saved as you are my praise. Tara, she texted and shared how she had met a sweet older lady named Mary on Buckner Road across from Cameron Farms who was out looking for her lost cat. Could we please say a prayer for her? Pam, we will say prayers for Mary and that that cat be found. So very thankful you were there and had the courage to reach out to her. Tara, thank you, Pam. God cares about the big things and the little things. Linda, yes, he does, and you were watching. Tara, Mary just called me to tell that she found her cat, and thank you for the prayers. Right after that, Rachel sent us a screenshot of a text message per John Knoop. Huge update. The sepsis is gone. The pneumonia is lingering, but he's on his way to recovery. He has a harsh cough, but it's moving. It looks like he's going to be here a few more days and might get out of the hospital Sunday or Monday. Thank you for the prayers. And then the praises just began. <laughs> My friends, I'm telling you, that's how the prayer clinic works. I got to share this one other one. This just happened these last couple of weeks. Urgent prayer request to all of you prayer warriors. Barron and Benji Webb are in our, members of our life group. Again, the small group, the life group ministry. And their grown son, Ben, had an accident with a bow and arrow. The arrow went into his eye. They live in Georgia. They're at the ER right now, and the ER is rushing to a trauma hospital in Atlanta where a team of ophthalmologists are waiting to see him to determine if he needs emergency surgery to save the eye. Please pray for his wife, for traveling safety. Um, we're all praying healing and protection in the mighty name of Jesus. Heather, our director, as always, first to respond, praying for Ben. Rachel, praying for Ben, his family, and the doctors to have knowledge and wisdom. Dana, praying for Ben. George, and all the other members of our prayer team, our prayers continue. Lord, we ask you to miraculously intervene and save Ben's eye. Praying for the arrow to be removed easily. Praying for the doctors working on Ben's eye. Asking God for miracles as he's being treated. Praying for comfort for him and his family. Asking Jesus to work through the medical team to completely restore sight. Believing and asking and praying and pressing and then the answer comes from Joanne a follow-up on our prayer request for Ben doctors can't believe that his eye is improving as it is they are seeing him daily and they are not talking surgery they think his sight may be restored fully in about a month barring any further complications what a miracle God has done <laughs> And once again, the praises start flowing on this group me. I asked Rachel and Joanne to ask John and the Webbs, of course, if I could share this this morning, and I received an update from both of them. John's dad just got back from a cruise. <laughs> and this Monday, this was the update for Ben's eye. This Monday, the doctor was just amazed that the blood was gone. Now they're waiting on the inflammation to go down. The new doctor was amazed at the condition of his eye. He expected it to be much worse. Ben is seeing 2020 out of his eye, and they're winning him off the drops. God is so good, and he's in the miracle working business. I don't have time to tell you about all the other answered prayers that, that we experience. A, a little girl named Gracie who was on a heart transplant list and now is off because of her health being better. Um, a guy on our team who lost his job and has a better job. A, a house that was just miraculously sold in the last couple of weeks. All of this to say God is in the listening business today just as he was in the days of Elijah. Now back to our story. I love this widow, I do. And if we look in verses 23 and 24, Elijah took the boy, he brought him down from the upper room into the house and he gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, look, your son is alive. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know you are a man of God and that the Lord's word in your mouth is true. 
this might really speak to some of the mothers in the room today. You see, this widow knew deeper because of the unimaginable ordeal she had to endure. If you're in a place where you can't make sense of God, a place where he's terribly disappointed you, a place where you question his motives and you question his actions or his inaction, God wants you to hear today, hang in there. Chances are the day is coming when you will see his power and his love. A day when you will experience the depth of his goodness and you will join this widow in proclaiming, now, now, now I know. I promised at the beginning of the message to share four ways to ignite your prayers so that they work. And I've spent a lot of time setting the stage for the public display of answered prayer that's coming. And in so doing, I'm sharing with you the first way to ignite your prayers so that they work. The first way to ignite your prayers so that they work is to remember how God has answered your prayers before. Answered prayers prepare you for answered prayers. And now we've made it to Mount Carmel and to my third point, Elijah at Mount Carmel. 1 Kings 18 is where Elijah hits the apex of his ministry. At Elijah's command, Ahab assembles the people of Israel for a showdown between the 450 prophets of Baal and Elijah, the prophet of God. It's an altar call for Israel that was coming three years and six months after the drought began. Let's pick up and read at verse 21 in 1 Kings 18. Then Elijah approached the people and said to them, this is why they're gathered on top of Mount Carmel, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people, they didn't answer a word. You see, the people knew they were guilty. Because the people of God knew that the first commandment was this. You shall have no other gods before me. God is the one and only. His people, the very nature of our relationship with him is that it is him and him alone. It's a relationship that is exclusive. You see, the people were practicing syncretism. Syncretism is the fusing together of the worship of God and the practice of the spiritual climate of the culture. They wanted to worship God and do whatever it took to experience prosperity. They wanted to be God's chosen people and enjoy their pleasure in whatever way they could. They were worshiping God and Baal, God and Ashtoreth. And it's at this place where the people are silent that Elijah then lays down his challenge. And this is what he says we're going to do. We've got two bulls here. And you 450 prophets of Baal, y'all offer yours to your God. And I'm going to offer mine to the Lord God. And then the God who answers with fire, he is God. That's verse 24. Now the people talk and they say, yeah, mm -hmm, that sounds good to us. That sounds good. That sounds good. Let's do that. And then, my friends, Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, y'all go first. Take your pick, and you perform your offering, and we'll see if your God will receive it by fire. And the shenanigans begin. Those prophets of Baal, they pick the best bull, according to what they, whatever you would think of a best bull might be. They chop him up, I guess, throw him on that altar, and they begin to pray. And my Christian standard Bible says they did a lame dance, a lame dance. Like I thought, well, that's the kind of dancing I'd be doing if I was around the altar, a lame dance. And they started dancing, and they started working themselves up into a frenzy. And, and by the time it got about midday, Elijah could not stand it. He started heckling them. He's like, maybe you need to pray a little louder. He might be sleeping. Where is Baal? Oh, maybe he went on a long trip. He didn't know we were going to gather here today. Or maybe even he's going to the bathroom. I mean, Elijah was having so much fun heckling those prophets of Baal. And those prophets of Baal were not having much fun. 
because they thought, I got to do more. I've got to do more. There's got to be a way. There's got to be a way to get what it is that I'm wanting to get, to get what it is I've got to get. And they start cutting themselves. And they cut themselves and they holler and they pray and they dance their lame dance. Their prayers were fervent. Their prayers were passionate. Their prayers were persistent. But my friends, were their prayers successful? Uh-uh. No. Mm-mm. Absolutely not. And why did their prayers fail? Because the power of prayer doesn't rest in the prayer. My friends, the power of prayer doesn't rest in the person praying. The power of prayer rests in the one to whom you are praying. And this is the second way to ignite your prayers so that they work. Remember to whom you are praying. Well, the prophets finished, and Scripture says in 1 Kings 18, 29, there was no sound, no one answered, no one paid attention. Baal didn't answer because God shut his mouth. Once the prophets of Baal were done, Elijah called the people in close. I mean, he wanted them to come near because he wanted them to be engaged in what was about to take place. And he then began the work of repairing the Lord's altar, And I believe he probably did this work with some of the strong men amongst the people. And they took 12 stones and built the altar. Why 12? Because there were 12 tribes of Israel. And you see, God knew that he was in the northern kingdom and there were only 10 there and the other two were in Judah. But what God wanted these guys gathered at the top of Mount Carmel to remember is your third secret. God never changes his mind when it comes to a covenant relationship. There may be, yes, that is a good thing. Thank you, Lord. There may be some people in this room today hearing this, or there may be some mamas who've got some kids hearing this or not hearing this or whatever, whatever. I just know there's people here hearing. And some, of, some might have made sincere commitments to the Lord as children. Sincere but then didn't get discipled, didn't really know something happened, and and life's gone on, and now not much to that anymore. I want you to understand that God is just as serious about a relationship with you now as he ever was, as he was when you were that child making that commitment at Bible school. So they set these stones in place, and Elijah, I believe, worked right alongside them. They not only built the altar, but then they dug a trench that was deep enough to hold four gallons of water. That's where I think he engaged with the women. He had them go get these water pots, and they brought the water, and he had them do an interesting thing with it. He had them pour the water, not once, not twice, but three times over the cut-up bowl, all the stones and and, um, the wood, and then the water ran into the trenches. And there's two things that I think right here. One is, why would you douse an offering with water when you're wanting God to show up with fire? And the other is, how precious that water must have been after three and a half years of a drought. Sometimes God asks us to do things that don't make sense at all. They conflict with the direction we think he's taking us. If only, oh, this is for me, we could put our brains in neutral and not try to figure it all out. We would eventually see that those things that made no sense were all part of his plan to demonstrate his glory on the platform of our lives in some tremendous way. Secret number four, God's ways are not the same as mine. And I have a verse there for you, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For the thoughts, for my thoughts, the Lord says, are not yours, neither are your ways mine, declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, I think at this point in time, Elijah wasn't worried, he wasn't bashful, he wasn't anything but just confident. And the third way to ignite your prayers so that they will work is to let your confidence in God be proven by your peace as you wait for your answer to come. If you're taking notes, you've got to write that one really fast. <laughs> to, let's see, 
to let your confidence in God be proven by your peace as you wait for your answers to come. Elijah didn't worry because he knew that God ruled. I think he kind of enjoyed heckling those Baal prophets throughout the day. He knew that Baal was not even a close second to God and that Baal had already been defeated. Do we know the same? Knowing that God rules is the secret to surviving and thriving when the powers of darkness are pressing in against you. Secret number five, know that God rules. Let's read Philippians 4, blah, 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 6 and 7 together. Let's read that verse out loud together. It's one of my favorites, and it's such a good one for us to take to heart at this moment in the message. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Commit that one to memory. And because Elijah knew what God was going to do, he prayed a simple 58-word prayer in the translation I was reading. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and I am your servant, and that at your word I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that this people will know that you, Yahweh, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. A man just like us praying a prayer just like this. Then, right after that, we read this. Yahweh's fire fell and consumed not only the bull, but also the wood and those stones and the water that had poured out into the trench and all of the dust with it. A huge fall of the power and the presence and the passion of the Lord God Almighty. The scripture says yeah, that the people saw it and they fell face down. And this time they spoke loudly, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. With the humble, obedient prayer of one man, just like us, the entire northern kingdom of Israel remembered who they were and more important than that, they remembered whose they were. I'm going to wrap up today's message, leaving you wanting that fourth point. It's in the podcast. <laughs> God told me this is where we needed to stop because he's got an altar call for us today. What I'm about to say is not a secret or a way or a fact. It's just something that is... That is Well, it is a fact. It's just a fact. The enemy knows your name, but calls you by your sin. God knows your sin, but calls you by your name. The Israelites stood before their God, guilty of infidelity. Nevertheless, God used Elijah to remind them that he was still their God whether they acknowledged him or not. Those 12 stones that built that, that altar represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And even though every one of those tribes had committed the heinous sin of unbelief and a myriad of sins that resulted from that sin of unbelief, God was eager for them to return to an intimate, dynamic relationship with him. One writer said this, sometimes a reminder of who we are is stronger than a rebuke of what we are not. Doesn't matter what you've done, my friends, or how many times you've done it. It doesn't matter where you messed up or nor how much your mistakes have wreaked havoc in your life or the lives of others. What matters is that the God who knows how many hairs are on your head loves you. He is seriously in love with you. 
serious enough to go to a Roman cross and bear crucifixion to pay the penalty for your sin so that you can know him. Altars represent communion with God. They were places where God's people worshipped him. They were where God's people prayed to him. They were where God's people declared dependence on him and died to themselves in order to live for him. The fact that the altar was in shambles was a huge indictment on the people. It showed just how far they were from God. With the fire, God demonstrated his passion for his people. He didn't slow roast that bull that day to perfection. No, he didn't. He sent and consumed it with one mighty flame. That's some fiery passion. I think God was eager to be back in fellowship with his people. What do you think? Some of us have experienced the passion, the power, and the presence of God in our lives. Oh, my goodness, did we ever experience it in this very room about a week ago at the community prayer service. Some of us have drifted away from God and forgotten what he's done for us in the past and what he's promised to do for us in the future. Every day, my friends, we have choices to make. We either do things on our own and dance with the culture of worship, to worship Baal and Ashtoreth and the other gods of our own making, or we cry out and surrender to God and the deliverance that he offers us. Has God sent a drought to get your attention? God sends droughts sometimes. He makes us thirsty for him because he loves us and longs for a thriving relationship with us. Unfortunately, when the drought comes, we work fervently, we persevere, and we give it all we got with a passion, but we forget to whom we belong, so we end up exhausted and wounded. Are your gods taking good care of you? Do they satisfy you? Can they prove their self-sacrificing love for you? Or are you having to do all that for them? We don't have time to talk about it, but the same God who sent the drought brought the rain. In fact, that is a hint toward the fourth point. My friends, the God who brought the rain to Israel is the God who is eager to soak you in his favor. He's eager to do more than meet your needs. God longs to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all you could ask or imagine. He's offering you himself. And when you enter into or back into a relationship with him, you get to take the adventure of your life. Let's pretend this is Mount Carmel this morning and that these steps to the platform are our altar. This picture of Tom kneeling at an altar is my favorite picture that's ever been made of our ministry here at Thompson Station Church. I remember that season of our church's life when we had a literal stone altar sitting right here in this place. We had so many beautiful experiences of worship during that season. Well, my friends, this is our altar today. Will you draw near or will you shrink back? Will you surrender to God or will you keep dancing for Baal? Aren't you tired of living less than what you know you can? This is our altar today. What business does God want to do with you? I want to invite our prayer partners to come forward and just be standing here. In fact, everybody can stand up because we're going to move right in to this invitation that's not from me, it's from the Lord. And if you are one of our people who receives people, come on up here and be ready to receive. And I know it's Mother's Day. And there are some people here that came just to honor your mother. And if your mother wants to go pray at that altar, or you know you'd like to go pray with her, it would be the best Mother's Day present you could possibly give her to come and pray with her at this altar. It might be that you want to give your life to Jesus. Come, talk to us, share with us, and you will get to experience what I'm talking about, the fiery passion that God has for you. Father, we want to want you as much as you want us. Let your passion and your power and your presence fall on us now. In Jesus' name we pray.